Hi, and welcome to our Google Hangout series entitled EM Match Advice, sponsored by the venerable Dr. Michelle Lin and her wonderful website, Academic Life in Emergency Medicine. This is a great web series topic today and a great set of panelists. We're going to be talking about how to score honors on your EM clerkship. And our panelists today are uh, Dr. Lin from UCSF and Academic Life, uh, Dr. Uh, Lainey Yaris from Oregon Health Sciences University, uh, Dr. Maria Morera from Denver Health, and Dr. Jan Schoenberger from LA County USC. So we know that scoring honors is very important. Uh, we have a few studies out in the literature that uh, illustrate that program directors um, look at just a few parts of the application very um, uh, seriously, and that tends to be your performance across third-year clerkships your step one score, and then certainly your performance on the EM clerkship, perhaps most importantly your performance on the EM clerkship. And that's interpreted in a couple of ways. One is through the grade itself, so we want honors if we can get honors. Uh, but certainly if you don't get honors, that's okay, as long as your slow, your standardized letter of evaluation reflects a hardworking, uh, diligent, intellectual person that's um, appropriate for our specialty. So how do we get those things, either the honors grade itself or the great slow uh, evaluation, if you will. Um, that's what our, our content uh, for our discussion is going to be today. So as a point of introduction, I'll, I'll tell you that students can try to figure this out on their own, right? They can do uh, a PubMed search and put in emergency medicine and clerkship and honors or performance, and you're going to get some hits. There's you know 30 to 40 articles out there on the EM clerkship. Most of them are on curriculum design and how to make it a standardized experience across medical schools, more useful for clerkship directors and program directors, administrators who are trying to figure out how to put their, um, their clerkship together. Much less information out there on how to grade, uh, certainly, and very little about the behaviors associated with great grades. So I'm going to give you three uh, articles to look up if you're interested in, in uh, searching the literature, and these are oldies but goodies. I'm going to say that they're a little bit dated, but the uh, folks who wrote them are certainly in leadership positions around the country at great residency programs. And the theme of these three articles are that they all list behaviors. These are behavioral-based articles. If you do this, you are more likely to succeed. So the first article came from uh, Gus Garmel and uh, Maha, uh, Swaminathan Mahadevan at the Stanford Kaiser program way back in April 2001. It was a letter to the editor uh, in uh, academic emergency medicine entitled The Outstanding Medical Student in Emergency Medicine. And it's um, a very short two-page uh, letter to the editor that reads very much like the outstanding medical student does this, the outstanding medical student does that. These are very behavioral-based suggestions and perhaps some that we're going to get into in our discussion today. The second is the AAEM Resident Student Association Rules of the Road for Medical Students, first published back in 2003. There's a chapter later in the book entitled How to Be a Star on Your Emergency Medicine Clerkship, written by Mike Winters and Amal Matu from University of Maryland. Um, this is on page 153 to 160 of this very long PDF. That's so the only part I really want you to skim through. And again, quite behavioral based, a little bit different in the sense that they give you some suggestions for how to prep for your clerkship, as well as what to do when you're on your clerkship, and then how to ask for feedback, an important part of um, appearing like a, uh, uh, an excellent or outstanding medical student who certainly wants to get better and, and wants to get a great evaluation. The last article um, is uh, one from 2008 out of Denver Health. Um, Jeff Druck, uh, Ben Honigman, and um, Chip Davenport wrote the three-minute emergency medicine medical student presentation. Uh, clearly, the presentation is critically important to getting a good grade, right? So this is your chance to show your intellectual prowess, your ability to make a differential diagnosis, your ability to consider um, treatment plans, and, and really distinguish yourself from um, the third-year clerkship um, uh, medical student, right? In third-year clerkships, you are the data gatherer. That's what you're judged upon on most of your rotations. Where when you move to sub-I's and, and fourth-year clerkships, you're really the data assimilator. It's time to take all that information in your H&P, create a differential, and make a plan. And that's really what that last article helps you do. So as a point of introduction, those are really the, the best behavioral-based uh, suggestive articles for uh, this topic. And now we're going to kind of get into some um, opinions from the program directors themselves, the folks that are um, definitely creating the grades and, and evaluating those grades and, and considering uh, medical students for both interview and for rank. 
So our first discussant is going to be Dr. Yaris from Oregon. And what I'd like to know um, from you, Dr. Yaris, is, is really what defines an honors level performance? How do you decide somebody deserves honors? Well, thanks, Mike. And I think um, I'm really glad you brought up the resources for the behavioral aspects because I really think it comes down to those behavioral aspects. There's a line that we see occasionally on letters of recommendation, um, this student function at the level of an intern. And if I had to kind of sum it up in one sentence, I think that's what defines honors level of performance for me. Um, not necessarily in terms of medical knowledge or procedures, but more it's a mentality. These students are all in. They consider themselves part of the team. They take ownership of their patients. They're proactive. They're enthusiastic. Um, you can tell because the nurses go to these students about their patients. And when you're all in the room together, the patients are looking at the student instead of somebody else on the team. So I think that sense of um, ownership and really being all in is, um, for me, what characterizes honors performance. Okay, well, that's great. So, uh, you know, I, I get a good sense of what it means to be functioning at the level of an intern. I, I would hope that would be a mid-year, end-of-year intern, perhaps more than, than uh, the early interns. Um, but, uh, you know, it's one thing to say that this person functions at the level of the intern and deserves honors or deserves a strong evaluation versus an average evaluation. You know, folks going into emergency medicine these days are very talented, and the average medical student is still um, quite talented. So what differentiates honors from high pass from pass? How is the grade actually calculated? So I think this is probably variable at different institutions. At our institution, um, for honors level performance, you have to have evaluations um, that are kind of in the top quartile. When you look at the spectrum, you also have to have a certain exam score and um, do an honors presentation. So, so I find that interesting when I read letters. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll see occasionally a letter that reads, this student narrowly missed honors, right, had they not bombed the exam. I mean, that's really the the uh, read between the lines. And I think the students can read these articles we suggested and look for the key behaviors and how to present and how to be diligent and hardworking on their rotation, but sometimes they forget simply to study for the test because that's going to be a component of their grade. Yeah, so that's a good point. I mean, it is really important when you're doing a rotation at home or away rotation to clearly look at the expectations and the objectives and how the grading is determined because at some rotations, the exam does not dictate the grade. At some, it's a pretty big part of it. So I agree the clinical performance, the oral presentations, the exam, and then if there's some sort of additional presentation or something like that, you really want to know about that before your rotation even starts so you can prepare for all of those things. Okay, that's great. That, those are great suggestions for how to prepare ahead of time. So thank you. Um, we're going to next switch to uh, Dr. Moreira from Denver Health. And, and what I'd like to get a sense of is, are there any differences between your rotation at your home institution and the very important away rotation? Certainly, folks need to uh, do away rotations, uh, by and large, uh, in, in today's uh, very competitive climate, and more and more students are choosing to do this. Um, how do you prepare differently when you go for an away rotation? So I don't think you actually prepare differently. I think, you know, regardless of where you're doing a rotation, you need to bring your A game. Um, and so it doesn't really matter, at least when I look at the students rotating from our, um, you know, from our school versus students that are coming to do away rotations, I look at them exactly the same. Because what I'm thinking is, am I going to want to work with you at 3 o'clock in the morning when, you know, everything's going crazy and everybody's tired? Um, am I going to be able to put up with you? <laughs> and can you? Um, you know, the medical knowledge, we all look at those applications, we see what their USMLE scores are, we see how they've done, uh, you know, in their third year clerkships. Um, so now what we want to do is can you apply that, you know, at the bedside? Can you do that? Um, and, you know, are you able to multitask? Do you work well in a team? You know, are you resilient, right? We're all looking for those people that can be resilient for our, um, for our residency programs. And so, you know, I, I don't think it matters whether it's your home institution or away institution. You still have to do the same thing, and you still have to show us that, that this is the right specialty for you and that you are going to be able to survive in our environment and you're, able to, you're going to be able to do well. One suggestion that I have for our students when they're uh, preparing to go for an away rotation is that I tell them, you know, part of that bringing your A game, as you say, uh, is, is really to be all in on the experience. You're going to have clerkship experience is certainly the the clinical shifts themselves and your medical clerk school uh, clerkship lectures that are part of the rotation. But then there's going to be residency lectures and residency skills labs and journal clubs in the evening that perhaps you're invited to that are, are separate. 
What do you think about that? So I tell I tell all the students um, when they're rotating, and I you know try to help them out also when they're going to leave here and go on other rotations, and also for their interviews. I tell them you should take advantage of everything that's available because that's also an opportunity for you to kind of get to know the other residents better, understand the dynamics of the residency program, understand what their philosophy, general philosophy is about education. Um, and so I tell them you know, and, and obviously sometimes they can't make to everything. You're not going to you know ding them for that either, but you know, they really should try to make as many things as they can because I think it's beneficial to them and it's also, you know, for us it's really important what our residents say about the students that are rotating. They spend a lot of time with them. And I'll tell you, if a resident comes to me and says, I don't want this student in this program, they're off my list. Um, the same thing, there's other students that sometimes maybe, you know, don't look as good on paper, but they come and they bring their A game and they work really well in a team and they are phenomenal in the um, clinical environment and they might come up really high on our list where maybe they weren't initially. So I think as you know, take advantage of everything is typically what I tell them because this is your time to really kind of shine. Any final words of preparation when uh, considering the the fact that you're going to want a letter, if you're going to want a slow when you do your away rotation? Um, any words of wisdom for how to identify who the the key authors of the slow are or um, who the players are in the department that that will help facilitate getting a good letter? Yeah, I mean, we set, uh, you know, in our program, we set up all the students with a mentor, and I'm sure other places do similar, uh, similar thing. And so we tell them to really kind of, uh, you know, set up meetings with that mentor, really get to know them well. We try to make sure that it's somebody that they're also going to work with clinically um, a bunch. And we're, you know, everybody that, that works with the students gives us input into their evaluations and into their grade at the end. Um, so what I what we really tell them is kind of to make sure that they are presenting to the attendings every so often because our, our senior residents kind of run the department so they're the ones that they present to a little bit more but you know we tell them make sure that you are having some face time with the attendings make sure that they get to know you that they get to know you by name um, and you know because that will go a long way you know when we're writing the letter and even if it's a program you know even if you decide the first couple of days you know this isn't really the place for me um, you still need to really have your A game on all the time because as you know we all know each other we all pick up the phone Absolutely. we do really Google Hangouts <laughs> together <laughs> why not if you get, you know, if you get uh, an honors grade that looks great but you also you know there are people that might get a high pass but they're phenomenal and like as, as you said before there are so many great candidates and you can't give everybody an honors um, and you know it's just about picking the right place for you and even though this, you know, if they come to our residency program and it ends up not being the right place, that's okay. But we want to help them find the right place. And they really need a good letter from the program in order to help them do that. So I tell them, you know, even if you decide in the first five minutes, no way, no how I'm coming here, that's okay. But you still kind of come every day and put your A game in and make sure that you get a good letter from us. All right, the keys to success for passing the 3 a.m. test at Denver. Thanks. <laughs> uh, so it's a, it's a great segue to, uh, to Dr. Schoenberger um, and uh, the pass-fail world of L.A. County, USC. So you know, we've talked to two um, program directors at institutions that are uh, an honors, high-pass, pass world, and um, certainly it's um, quite evident how you can shine when you go to one of those places. You come home with an honors in your back pocket and, and you... <laughs> you've done well, but when you go to a, a place that has so many rotators like LA County um, and a pass-fail system, how do you shine? How do you stand out from the rest of the crowd? Um, well, it's a good question and I can certainly understand where students have uh, anxiety about that. Um, but I think that you know when you, get a, when you do get the letter of evaluation, the slow, there's, there's a text part of it and the words that go into the text part of it are probably more important, at least to me when I read letters, than even the grade itself, frankly. So how you're described in the letter um, and how you're described overall is, is, is really what it comes down to. So um, I think you're right. The pass-fail thing basically means the grade doesn't matter that much, but the text, even with a grade, the text part matters a lot. So how you're described is what it's going to boil down to, and I think that um, we've already talked a lot about the behaviors that are associated with really good descriptions of you that are going to appeal to program directors. You know, things about your work ethic, think, things about your ability to take feedback, things about your um, team, you know, team ability to work on a team. All those things are going to be important descriptors of you. Great, great. Um, Dr. Lynn, you've been uh, uncharacteristically quiet here. <laughs> um, I'm just conniving some questions. That's conniving some questions away. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on what you've heard so far? Some of these key behaviors, ways to stand out. Um, 
perhaps yeah. the, the comments that you're going to want to try to generate in those narratives that uh, Jan talked about. It, it's a challenging time, right, for these students because EM is increasingly becoming a very competitive specialty because it is the best specialty out there, obviously. <laughs> Uh, but it is challenging for them, and so, you know, I, I struggle with, you know, all of these tips. I think generally people know, like, you know, realize that away rotations, that you're being evaluated all the time. You know, don't get lulled in the fact that oh, this is a happy hour. It's fine to kind of let loose. Um, and, and to just kind of have your A game at all times. But my question really is, like, not everybody can get honors. Even stellar people are not getting honors. And, you know, and we kind of come upon these students... Um, after the fact, right? After they've gotten their high pass or after they've gotten their, their pass, you know, how, what do you say to them then? I mean, like, uh, it's time to go into a new field, um, you know, give up medicine. You know, what is your kind of go-to uh, counseling for them? And, and that's what I struggle with all the time, and, and people get so disheartened by it. But then, you know, you say you want the textual behavioral-based letters, but then, you know, how do you exactly go about doing that? And I, I want to kind of throw it back out there. Um, to the group about like maybe what are your personal styles about counseling these groups of people? Jan, maybe we could start with you since again you're you're uh, one who values the narrative and values the behavioral comments. Um, perhaps you could you could share your thoughts on that first. On uh, so the question is about how to counsel people who don't do all that well. Yeah, exactly, oh, okay. exactly. But, you know, who, who are solid candidates who don't get like the honors at uh, Denver Health and don't get honors at OHSU. But you still think are very valid applicants for EM. Well, you know, what suggestions do you have for them? Um, well, I, I, there, you know, there's a program for everybody, and I think looking at what somebody's strengths are and um, you know where they're going to best fit in, it's, it's a really complicated question because there's so many individual scenarios that I can think of of, of people that I've counseled in those situations. Um, you know, I like when I'm writing letters ab uh, about people who aren't necessarily the very, very top of the, the cream of the crop. You know, I think there are other behavioral things that really matter. I was going to mention, um, you know, things just about being compassionate to patients. You know, you don't have to be a brilliant or, you know, a, a fantastic at everything to just be nice to people when you're at your rotation. And those are really good qualities that most of us look for. Um, and so, you know, I don't know. In terms of like what, how I advise the students themselves, I think they're just individual strategies. It just depends on what your strengths are. Yeah, I, I like that that answer a lot because I think it's a matter of you know sitting down with your mentor and really talking about you know is what is it that you love about emergency medicine? Let's talk about what strengths you have and, and you incorporate that um, into your letter. And for our shop, you know, we have a departmental letter, so all of that kind of gets morphed into a a summative uh, description of yourself as, as the letter goes forward. Do you guys actually have a department or departmental slow? I have a hard time saying slow. It's like, you're slow. No, I'm slow. But no, <laughs> so you guys have a department slow that goes out? At, at USC, we do. Um, we, in fact, we the very first day of the clerkship, whether you're a home student or a away student, we make it very clear about what the process is for getting the letter because we know that everybody's that's what they need to know. So we do do a departmental slow that uh, our clerkship director writes in addition to me that we sign together, um, and that's the students know that from the very beginning. So th they kind of know how that's all going to happen, and we and we tell them we're gonna we're gonna take uh, comments, the narrative from the residents you work with, from the faculty you work with, and so they kind of know where the information is going to come from. Lainey? We, we do have a departmental letter at OHSU too. And I, I wanted to just really quickly echo one of the things that Jan said. I think um, the message to not be discouraged if you're not one of those students who gets honors is really important. I have this theory that although the honors in EM is really important, but the things that cause a student to get honors in a student rotation are not necessarily the same things that causes somebody to thrive and excel as a resident. So I might actually look for evidence of those characteristics more than I look for the actual grade. So the behavioral um, aspects are really important. That's funny. My internal uh, secret threshold, I guess it's not so secret anymore, I'm about to tell it, but anyone that scores over 235 on the boards <laughs> is a red flag for me. <laughs> like, you should not do that well and be a normal person. Um, so, <laughs> so anyway, let my secret out. I don't like people who score too high. <laughs> <laughs> Maria, how do you create your letter at your department? So we're actually changing that because before we used to create letters where Whereas the mentor would write the letter, but the problem was if if you know the mentor didn't spend as much time with the with the actual applicant, 
or you know maybe they didn't have as much experience writing the letters I think that could create some problems for the applicants so we are going to having a departmental letter where the um, clerkship director is going to be writing the letter with input from all of us as well and which I think it will work a lot better for the students um, overall um, and it'll engage all the faculty more sort of in that process of the evaluation um, but I, I'd like to also agree with everybody I think you have to remember that you know when you're looking for residency classes, you're also looking for a diverse class, and you're looking for individuals to, that bring different things to the table. And that, um, you know, so we wouldn't all want people that have like you're talking about 235. I mean, when you look at people that have 270 or 280, you're like, do you, can you actually relate to people? You know, sometimes I'm not really yeah, sure. They're already like, automatically banned. Yep, they're off the list. <laughs> And I actually think that, I, I actually, when I look at the rotation, where it's really helpful is I, I look at the people that do really, really well sort of in that 270 group, and what I want to see is can they apply the knowledge, or are they just really book smart, but really clinically they're not that great, um, and can they relate to patients. And then I look at the people that maybe haven't done as well on their USMLE, but are great clinicians, you know, and, and do a great job um, as a team member, and, and you know, and are people that, that we would all would like as our physicians. And so I think it's really helpful in those two extremes when people rotate because you really get a better feel, right? But also just reminding them that programs look for a lot of different things in their candidates and they don't want the same individual in their, you know, whatever 14, 18 candidates. They want, you know, they want different people that come together and make a great group or a great class um, of individuals that bring something different to the table. So I think that kind of helps a little bit more because your grade is made up of different components, right? It's made up of your your exam grade, it's made up of your, you know, presentation, it's made up of your clinical evals. And so any of those components can change that grade to a certain extent. Um, and we're all looking for individuals that bring different things to the table. Well, as a preview, I was going to try to end the session with take-home points for the students. And certainly the first one is you should bomb step one and you'll be much more <laughs> liked by this group of program directors. That's, that's a great takeaway, Dr. Lynn. I'm You're glad welcome. that we're doing this series. You're welcome. Don't bomb. Don't bomb. Just don't do too well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. don't do well. Yeah. Stay average. Average is good. <laughs> <laughs> um, lady, I, I'm going to I'm going to throw this question to uh, each of the three of you. You know, as we talk about behaviors, perhaps we can close with some um, uh, do's and don'ts, pearls and pitfalls. Um, we've talked about a few of the behaviors that are uh, important, certainly around bedside manner and work ethic. But if you could give one or two, um, you absolutely must do this, and and perhaps even more importantly, don't do that. Don't make this common mistake. Uh, that can uh, risk a good grade or risk a good narrative description of you, what would those be? Let's start with uh, with you, Lady. Okay, so I think my top three would be um, you have to play well with others, and that has to be really apparent across the spectrum of everyone that you interact with. Um, show empathy and compassion, and hopefully that's a genuine empathy and compassion. And then, um, you know, be self-directed and reflecting upon your performance, not just seeking feedback, but kind of giving yourself feedback and then seeking reflections upon those. As far as the do not, I think, um, you know, it's always discouraging if there's a, a student who makes a joke at the expense of a patient or says things that you wouldn't want said about you if you were a patient or your family member. So I think that's the thing that probably gets people into the trouble the most. Yeah, certainly, you know, it's very uh, easy to fall into the uh, trap of being overly familiar with a new group of uh, strangers and you're trying to make jokes at, at 3 a.m. to pass Maria's test and uh, you know there's a, a thin line between uh, professionalism and, and um, some off-color comments and, and certainly you have to resist the, uh, the desire to be overly familiar. Um, yeah. I, I totally agree. Maria, what, what are your thoughts on this? I, I'm sure that you could tell some stories about some uh, of the most uh, egregious mistakes along the way. Do you have any words of wisdom? Sure. I mean, I think one that everybody forgets about has nothing to do with the clinical setting, but one um, is be nice to the coordinators. So any I, what I find students doing that gets them into trouble <laughs> with us sometimes is that, you know, they're either too impatient or they're rude to the coordinators. And these are the people that will make sure that you're okay in residency most of the time, make sure that you get everything done that you need to get done. And that, and if you're not respectful to everybody around you, regardless of who they are, then that says a lot about an applicant. So, you know, regardless of it's the coordinator, the nurses, you know, introduce yourself to all these people and be patient with them and know that you can learn from everybody around you. Um, that's one thing that really kind of bothers me when they're not um, 
respectful uh, of everybody else that we work with. The other thing is if you know if you see the residents work like running around and you're sitting there on your in your you know on a chair doing nothing, there's a problem. Now even if you know if you can't pick up another patient because everybody's being seen already or because your senior said wait I don't want you to pick up another patient yet, there's That's always a bad sign by the way. Right, there's always things that can be done, right? So, so really kind of, you know, ask, what can I do? How can I help you? And also have that sort of social intelligence to know when it's a good time to ask questions and to know when it's not a good time to ask questions. Um, I feel like there's times when, you know, students, I mean, I know they're, they're excited and they want to learn and they kind of want to show off to you, but sometimes they're, they're inappropriately asking questions at times when everybody's kind of going crazy and the whole department's falling apart, right? So they need to have that social intelligence, um, you know, as well. And they also should not make themselves look good at the expense of others. So, you know, throwing other students under the bus, throwing the residents under the bus, those kind of things, I think, you know, that, that says a lot about the student. And, you know, I'm thinking about, wow, what are you going to do when you're here as a resident? And how would you, you know, work with others? And, um, and you're really more sort of about yourself than about sort of that whole team approach. So those are probably my, my big do not do's. Yeah, and that's a slippery slope when you're on an away rotation and you really want to try to do your best. That um, there, there are certainly social cues to tell you to dial it back a little bit and get off my coattail and let me just document for five minutes and then I'll spend some time teaching you. I, I, I agree. I agree. Jan, uh, again, I some great. pitfalls that you agree. So pearls and pitfalls and those that kind of drive how you do that narrative description when you write your uh, letters. What? What are the things that easily fill a, a great letter and easily fill a terrible letter? Well, I, see, I like the topic of pitfalls because I've seen so many pitfalls. And so sometimes pitfalls can also just be, if you flip it over, it's kind of the what, what to do instead of the what not to do. But let me just give you three of my, my seen pitfalls, which is, um, number one, admit when you don't know something and just stay humble. Sometimes students feel like they have to know it all and they have to, you know, they have to pretend like they know what they're doing when they don't necessarily know what they're doing. And sometimes that can be at the patient's expense. So, you know, admit when you don't know something, if you've never done a procedure before, you don't know the answer to the question, it's okay to say, I'm not sure about that. It's okay. Being a know-it-all, it can be very annoying. Um, number two, you don't need to give gifts to people at the end of your rotation. Not necessary. Um, you know, we I had like a guy whose who's dad, who's dad owned a car wash. <laughs> and he was giving out car wash vouchers to everyone, and that was like the big. You know, like don't you don't need to do that. No one needs to get gifts at the end of your rotation. It's our job. We don't. We like to do it. It's okay. No gifts. Um, and number three, I would also say just um, don't get really personal with people unless they, you know, open the door for you. So I've had people ask me a lot of really personal questions just because they were trying to get to know me better, and it was uncomfortable for me. Some people will, you know, if they open the door and they give you something personal about themselves, a resident or attending or a nurse, then okay, you can get to know them. But sometimes, you know, people are kind of prying because they want to get familiar with everybody, and that's a mistake, so I wouldn't do that. Well, I, I'm clearly doing something wrong because I'm not receiving gifts from my uh, <laughs> my students. So uh, I defer to you on on uh, the best way to mentor. Perhaps when you write your letters this year, we can see at the bottom gift colon non gift colon car wash voucher. Um, that would really be quite insightful. You don't even have to put it into a narrative form for me. All right, Michelle. Any uh, any final thoughts on the topic? No, just to, just reflecting across the board, it sounds like it's interesting that red flags and pitfalls really don't have to do about medical knowledge, but more on the cognitive stuff of the professionalism and communication skills, because we find that, you know, that's the hardest stuff to teach, right? I mean, all the medical knowledge stuff, procedures, we can teach you during residency. Um, it's all of this other stuff that we're going to want to try to filter for and try to figure out where, where your pathologies may or may not exist. Um, and so these are all perfect examples. Honesty is always the best policy, and uh, and I do like Maria's point about uh, the program co uh, coordinator. Um, he or she is the core of the residency program for us. You know, if you mess with our program coordinator Eve, the whole department will come down on you. It, it's like it's the end. Um, so just be very careful who you uh, relate with, and especially the program coordinator. All right, I think this has been a great discussion. I I hope those watching. Um, We'll uh, have some, some good pearls and uh, behavioral tips and tricks to uh, think about as they prepare for their rotations. Um, I'm very grateful to our panelists for taking time to speak with us today. And as a thank you, I want to give you the opportunity to tell us something awesome about your program and the place where you work. This is a, a chance to have a free commercial, if you will, for, 
for all those uh, who spent the time to get to minute 30 on our video here. So let's start with Lainey. Uh, I want you to tell me something I don't know about OHSU, and I know a lot about OHSU. <laughs> Well, I think um, I mean, most people think of OHSU and they know that we're really laid back and friendly. There's great coffee and wine and everybody climbs mountains. But I think um, the things that students are sometimes surprised to find out is that there's really this quiet intensity, um, unassuming excellence in the faculty. And we have some um, amazing leaders in the field, some of the pioneers of emergency medicine. You would never know it um, working with them, even working with them for years. So I think that culture of um, unassuming but also always striving to do better and advocating for the patients is something that I'm really proud of about OHSU. That's great and certainly there's lots to be proud of at Oregon. You guys have a wonderful faculty, tons of different interesting um, research uh, interests and fellowships. It's really a great place uh, for students to check out. Maria, tell me something I don't know about Denver Health. Mm, something you don't know. I don't know. <laughs> so, I mean, I think, uh, you know, similarly we have, I think, amazing residents that really uh, care about the program and that always are looking to make it better and that really care about who comes here as well um, to continue the legacy of the program. But I mean, I think one of the things is that, you know, people know about Colorado. They know the mountains. They love the fact that we have great skiing and all that. But what I tell them is when you come to residency, it's for something different. And I think what what they need to know here is that you're going to get a great clinical experience. This program is really about seeing a lot of patients. Um, and I feel that, you know, there shouldn't, the, the patients are the best teachers. And so the, if you like to get great clinical experience and, and see a lot and that's how you learn best, this is a great place. Well, I, I can't disagree. I, I have gotten to know you over the last several months, in particular on a couple different panels, and you are standard is quite high. The bar is set very high at Denver and uh, I, I think that uh, definitely translates into a great training experience and a great legacy. I, I'm glad to use that word. It was taking away the word I was going to use. Your uh, folks certainly have ownership over that place and, and developing the legacy is uh, a wonderful uh, and known attribute about Denver. And then Jan, I, I don't know if there's anything we don't know about LA County after the Code Black movie. Um, so you're going to have to really try to tell me something I don't know about USC. Oh man, yeah, it's a, it's been a good year for getting out there what we do. Um, but I think one thing people don't realize that's really important to the people who work here is uh, number one, the history of our program. It, ma it matters a lot to those of us who are here. It, we feel that we want to continue a legacy just like Maria mentioned. Um, but something that's also really important to the people who work here and the residents that we look for, potential residents, is a dedication to service. And uh, we are particularly dedicated to service of the community that surrounds us. Our hospital's been here for a hundred years and we're very interested in helping the Latino community around us and people who have a history of service or um, uh, um, you know, community outreach are people who are generally really happy here because we do a lot of patient education and a lot of uh, community involvement. So that's something about our local environment here that I want people to know about. That's great. I, certainly there's no hospital in America more patient-centered than LA County. I, I think that your service to the local community is uh, certainly laudable and, and uh, Gosh, everything that you get to learn in that movie uh, about you guys is just really remarkable. So uh, students, you. definitely, you should check out all three of these. Michelle, can I say the word badass? Badass programs. Beep, um, beep, beep. There you go. I, I needed to get her to, to chime in a little bit at the end. Um, and I'd like to point out, this has been a really great panel uh, that included three women in leadership positions in emergency medicine. There's not that many women in uh, residency director positions, and what a great panel to, to have three badass programs and uh, three badass program directors. Thank you very much for that. Um, so to close, I, I think we learned a lot of great things in this discussion today. Certainly behavioral aspects to the residency uh, or to the clerkship experience, I, I should say, really uh, predetermine uh, much of your success in residency and to demonstrate uh, a great work ethic and great bedside manner, um, good social cues, uh, those are some, some great takeaway points for, um, for students who are considering how to prepare for, for their clerkship. Thank you guys very much. Uh, I hope you enjoyed today's Hangout and look for some other topics uh, as uh, we prepare this series. Thanks.